Welcome to the Wilson Center Middle East Program Art in Mena series, which features diverse artists from across the sector to highlight their work. Today, I'm thrilled to be speaking with Nadia Hatter, a film director from Qatar. Thank you for joining me, Nadia. Thank you for having me, Brooke. Nice to meet you. Likewise. So start by sharing your journey to becoming a filmmaker. Were you always interested in this line of work? Yeah, so I guess um, my first interest came as a teenager, like about 13 or 14. Um, one of the things that got me interested was that I felt um, that the Arab world was really poorly represented or intentionally even misrepresented on screen. And that kind of stuck with me. And so I had this interest from from that really and later down the line when I after I graduated from university I decided that it was time that I was going to try to make something um, either you know at least at the very least to show that there is there are there is there there are points of view in this region that um, I think are, are, are it's good to project and so that, yeah, people know that there's people here and there are humans and not just um, political stories or political objects. And what was the process like when you decided to get started in the industry? So where, where did you start and what was your journey at the beginning of your career? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I initially, so I, I, I got in touch with a local producer here actually he's an american um, his name is justin kramer and he was ceo of a production company and i brought a story that i had about deep fake technology to him and so that was a short um script that i prepared and and i kind of like saw if he could support the film and the vision and he was really generous and with his resources and produced my first short with me um, later down the line, I did get uh, granted um, uh, film grants from Doha Film Institute, which made that ultimately possible without, you know, breaking my wallet. <laughs> so, um, so that was the first, uh, that was the story of the first um, short film that I produced. The second short film that I made um, was first now that I think I, I had gotten a little bit of credibility for my first short was granted by Doha Film Institute again and I got a couple of grants for that and again um, Justin Kramer produced that one so but in addition to that which I think um, is something to note was I did a crowdfunding campaign so um to my knowledge, it hadn't been done in the area or at least in Qatar. Um, and so I thought, you know, if I'm going to make a film for people and that this is something that they want, then hopefully I can I can tap on that for support, um, especially if that's that's the kind of messaging that they want to send or the stories that they want to tell. Um, and so I did the crowdfunding campaign and it was it was very successful and we raised almost like fifteen thousand dollars and um and and in the process it was really interesting that I got to hear so many stories from people in the community that were touched by this the, the narrative that I was telling um and I can always talk about that that short too if, uh, and the story there if you need yeah please do is that a proposal that you're referring to yeah. Yeah. So um, that was going to be kind of my next line of questioning. I'd really love to hear um, if you could tell the audience more about the storyline for that and also where the inspiration came for that short. Yeah. So uh, so a proposal is about a young Qatari man who seeks approval to marry a non Qatari woman. And um, and so the inspiration, or I guess the background here is that in in Qatar, and I think, I'm not sure regionally if there's similar situations, but you need government approval to get married to a non-Qatari. So um, 
so yeah, so I took, I took that story because um, it, it touches many of us. I mean, I personally have married a foreigner. And so when I went through that process, I saw how it worked. And, and I thought, you know, I don't think many people are aware of, of it. And I think it's something that would be interesting to see on screen and especially for my local community, but also, you know, it could interest people internationally too, because maybe they can relate. I mean, I would even go so far as to say in other countries in Europe, in the US, you do have to get approvals in a way to marry non-citizens. Um, it's a little bit different here, admittedly. Um, so yeah, and so that in the course of the Indiegogo, the crowdfunding campaign, um, I was contacted by so many people who had faced similar situation. And it was like, my brother went through this, or my, my dad went through this, or I'm going through this. And so that really made me feel that, okay, this was something that people can relate to and is good to talk, talk about and tell. One of the common themes that have come across in these interviews is artists begin with an idea that's very personal to them that they want to kind of express or a, a story that's that's personal to them. And then throughout, um, you know, putting their work out there, so many people reach out to them and say, this really resonated with me as well. And thank you for, you know, representing my story. So it sounds like you've um, had a similar experience, and I'm sure not just um, among the local audience, but probably regionally, and as you said, internationally as well. So can you just um, speak a little bit about what, what it's like to receive that feedback, you know, and um, especially as a young filmmaker, kind of um, how, how that's affected your work, and also if there was any feedback that maybe surprised you, or even, you know, kind of negative feedback that you had to learn from. Um, well, you know, it's kind of interesting to hear that, um, and, and also a little reassuring that, that you know, just, just when even if initially I feel like this is, might be too personal of a story that it's good to, to, to try and get it out there. Uh, in, in terms of the reactions, like I, I was saying a bit earlier, that the Indiegogo was one of those ways that I saw all of the positive feedback and that people could could relate to the content and had um, had a lot to say about it and, and, and wanted to see this depiction of this bureaucracy on screen. Um, and so it was overwhelmingly positive, really. I, 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 I would have to say that. The only thing I think is there's a bit of, in terms of depicting our community on screen, um, I, 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 I think even regionally, there is a very deep sensitivity about it. Um, you know, there, it, I, I think it's, I'm trying to think of the right words. I, it's a very personal thing for people here. You sh they're used to seeing Hollywood stories on screen. So it's, it's not going to offend anyone when there's like a transformer on the screen and like there's like superheroes running around shooting things and blowing things up. Um, so that's, you know, easy content for them. And they're used to that. But when it comes to depicting like family drama, really, or like cultural issues or, or conflict, you know, conflict in our communities or in our spaces, it is really, um, it's hard to keep people not going on guard. I think the audience here quickly gets on guard. And so I have received not negative feedback, but maybe a extreme concern, or I think overly concern that, um, that people will be unhappy or can't handle the story, um, which, I think is a mistake 
because I would hope that they can handle such a story. Um, and I think sadly or unfortunately that holds people back and people like self-censor because they are afraid that it will be poorly received just on the basis of, of bringing up anything local. Um, so I think that's what I would say in terms of the, the range of the feedback. I think there was a lot, I mean, there was a lot of like, oh, like you can talk about that. Is that legal? Well, I mean, of course it's legal. It is just the way that our, our legal system is functioning. So it's just a reflection of some of the elements of life in Qatar, you know? So Sure. It's, it sounds also like a very self-reinforcing cycle where the less that it's talked about, the more people feel like they're not then able to talk about it, which is what's so important about kind of these, um, you know, first stories getting out there and starting these conversations because it really does begin to break down those, those barriers to, to highlighting the issues that you want to highlight. And um, so it, it sounds like it really took a lot of courage to, to put this work out there and to start to talk about these issues that you wanted to, to highlight and not even necessarily issues, but again, just personal stories and how that's affecting families and, and relationships um, just to, again, to represent um, a daily reality for people in, in Qatar. So did you ever, um, you know, hearing that kind of concern from people, um, did it ever make you question or hesitate putting your work out there? Or were you really just, you know, very determined from the start to, to, uh, to continue essentially? Yeah, you, you, ha you made a good point. And I think that's one of the big things or the biggest problem with the self-censorship is that the line keeps coming backwards instead of, instead of at least just staying in one place and that everything just becomes more and more and more constricted. So yeah, it, it did make me hesitate, but I had a trust that I could, I could depict the story in, in, like a, in a delicate way. Um, it's a comedy. So that was one way of, of presenting this story and and being respectful to to and and, and yeah I think res I think respectfully displaying everything as it is so so yeah I think comedy helps a lot so in an article actually published by the Wilson Center's Middle East program um you were quoted um as, as saying, you know, kind of touching on these topics that film directors tend to st stay away from, you know, more sensitive and, and private um, topics. And the author, um, Hind Ansari, she's a, a fellow here at the Middle East program. She said that one, um, one kind of development that is helping move the industry along is education and especially, um, you know, kind of uh, the more international, like the more basically movement of people, you know, there's the American institutions that are in Education City in Qatar um, that can kind of help introduce new ideas um, and new, you know, people basically to, to the industry. So I'm wondering if you could comment on that and just other developments that maybe could help um, push against this self-censorship? You know, I know you mentioned that yours was a comedy and that did help you, but what other ways can film directors um, try to just break down this, this construct and this self-censorship? Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I think like, for example, Qatar Foundation has a bunch of these Western universities or just really like great institutions in there. Um, and, and, and maybe it gives people a little bit of courage and how to, you know, think and talk about things. And um, I, I guess maybe what I would hope for or, or what I think may happen. There are, I've, I've heard some really bold voices from my generation and, um, in different fields and in, in photography and in, and in um, even in music and, and even fashion. So 
So kind of over the broad spectrum, I do see that there are these examples of, of sort of like very, they have some courage to make untraditional art or pieces and um, discuss sometimes in public forums or panels or some more sensitive topics. So I, I hope, and, I, and it looks like that there is that desire to explore and, and express these, any topic like openly and, and express their thoughts and their feelings. So I, I hope so, and I, and I see it, so maybe. And there's fellow filmmakers too that I think ha have the talent and, and, the, and the voice to bring some really, really great stories to life and hopefully bring other topics to the table that I haven't myself. Um, pivoting a little bit to more about kind of your personal experience, um, I'm curious what your um, experience has been as a, as a woman in the industry, especially as a, a young woman um, in a not just uh, this is not just an issue in Qatar, but in the film industry worldwide tends to be um, male dominated and especially older male dominated. So I'm curious if there were any unique challenges that you faced or, um, you know, other opportunities maybe as, as a woman. Um, you know, that's a, that's actually a good question. Um, in a way, because we didn't have any existing infrastructure or like industry around this um it's kind of been growing um, or maybe like hopefully I could say it could have leapfrogged because um I didn't face any resistance or any struggle as a as a woman at all um I think in that way because there weren't any expectations about who's doing this kind of thing um and, and I can even say that out of, you know, any of the artists that I know of my generation, you know, I, I think I might know more women actually than men that are, are you know, being able to express themselves and, and push their vision. So, so I, I would hope that in that way, I could just say that we've kind of been able to get around some, like some of the, like the deep, fundamental institu institutions and another kind of industry that it's harder to unravel because we just didn't have anything to begin with in that way. So it was kind of a, a silver lining to the fact that we don't have a big bubbling, you know, space yet. So, so yeah. Really, that's really interesting um, perspective that, um, kind of the the lack of industry, if you will, is allowing more emerging artists, you know, whether they're young or old or male or female, to to enter the industry because um, essentially there are no barriers, um, which is really kind of an interesting perspective because again, in in past interviews that I've I've spoken with, um, some of the artists, again, not just not just women, but the barriers come from the industry itself, from the art galleries or the you know art institutions that you have to have very deep networks to be able to enter into or a lot of funding or a lot of you know experience basically to advocate for yourself and to get into these institutions whereas in in your experience um you know you're almost you're almost starting with kind of a blank sp space you know a blank palette and you're able to um, are, you know, filmmakers like you are able to build the industry um, in almost like a more um, kind of open, open way. So given that, you know, what are some of um, the qualities that you think are important to, um, to focus on? So you said that you had the Doha Film Institute that um, gave you you know, um, resources and, and funding. What are some other um, either uh, you know, institutions or other resources that could help um, other people who are interested in joining the film industry? Um, I think Doha Film Institute is the biggest um, player in the space. 
they have they have this they have few grant cycles and they're you know really fundamental to creating any film scene here um, because unfortunately making films takes a lot of money um, and and Doha Film has also been really expansive and they've done a lot of um, a lot of funding for Arab for the general Arab world so not just Qatar actually I would say like that is one of their biggest um, biggest uh, activities because they have films that have been to Cannes and been to Venice and all over the world. So, um, so now when I see a Doha film credit in the beginning of a movie, I'm not surprised anymore. It's, I, it's, they're very active in the space. So they have really good experience, which is a good thing too. So they, they can support the filmmaker from a few different regards and they have this network too. So I would say for Doha film is kind of like the big big, big institution. If you want to get involved in the space, it's kind of where you start at if you can, if you can't. Um, other than that, well, I mean, that's the thing. I think there's not much of a private sector, like there's no private sector for this. We don't have um, like producers. If you are looking for like the thing with the, I think the thing with the private sector is getting them to move and like be interested in this space it's kind of hard because it's a risky space because we don't have it's a blank space like you said um it's we don't have a model of like making the money back but you know in some ways you don't always need to like you don't really always need to just make money from something like sometimes it's just good to have for your community and it's it's and I think it's especially important for Qatar which is a small country um, to project its identity to the world because um, because that's a big part of maintaining our own security is that people are or the international community is aware that we exist and that we we are a sovereign nation and so that if those if our sovereignty is ever tested, that there would be a strong response or a strong defense or a strong belief in our sovereignty. So, um, so just going beyond just the fact that it's entertainment or even just for the, the cultural value of it, but it's a security problem for us. It's a security, no, I wouldn't say problem. I would say it's a security resource. It's a security asset to build a strong film industry and strong cinematic imagery that reflects Qatar. That really, um, I really appreciate that last point that you made and it really makes it full circle where you said there's so far, there's kind of a lack of private sector funding for it. And when you were faced with that, you turned to your community and you, you turned to crowdfunding because you knew how important it is for this story and and these narratives to get out you know not just for yourself and for your own benefit but for the benefit of your country and and your community so that um i i really genuinely appreciate that and the more people who who do that you know the more you'll lay that foundation for for showing all of the great benefits not just money wise or economically but also you know culturally and and even possibly politically as you as you mentioned in the end so that really does bring it um full full circle and and uh it's really neat that you did draw on on your community and and crowdfunding resources to to work on a proposal so um just wrapping up i'm i'm curious what you're working on right now and what your um visions are for your for your next project if you're working on any so right now, um, I have a couple of short films in development, um, and the one, uh, yeah, actually, one of the short films that I can mention um, is following a young woman who, uh, after her father disappears, has to take on um, the fertilize the pollinization of her palm trees. So it's kind of like a simple local story. And 
and yeah I wanted to kind of showcase the aspects of like palm trees and how it works to pollinate them but also I mean there's a deeper story there and so hopefully when it's ready then I can share that of course with with maybe with Wilson Center or whoever is interested and and yeah and so I, I also have a feature film in development but that may take some time so my shorts are in the focus for it for now very neat very neat well we'll absolutely um be on the lookout for that and thank you so much for your time it was a really very fascinating discussion 